if we think about this current war, uh, Russia's current war on Ukraine, it's quite common, for example, in Western media to see people saying, oh, well, but what about these deaths? What about the fact that it's making certain, you know, segments of the population making it harder for them economically? But that's, for many reasons, that's not going to probably be an issue for Vladimir Putin, not least because he doesn't care. But also that's not where the greatness of the nation comes from. The mm. greatness of the Russian nation is not measured through its ability to... Um, make life better for its people. It's measured by its ability to project its power. Um, and mainly that means projecting it abroad. Dr. Jade McGlynn is a researcher at King's College London that looks at how Russia uses history to shape the present. We talked about why regular Russians support the war, whether Putin believes his own propaganda, and why is Ukraine so incredibly important for him and for Russia in general. Enjoy. All right. Um, so welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Your research, one of the main aspects of your research is looking at how Russia uses history to basically promote its interests. And if I should play the devil's advocate for a little bit uh, to start, I wonder if you could explain to what extent is what Russia's doing different than uh, what other countries are doing, because most countries construct sort of myths about um, their own history. So how is Russia different in that? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really good point. Um, I don't think that what Russia is, is doing is all that different. All countries use history. Everybody uses history, draws analogies of the past to make sense of the present, to make sense of the new that is going on around them. There's nothing pathological um, in using history and rewriting it and making yourself look a little bit better in the past than perhaps you actually were. The difference in Russia, I would say, is twofold. One is the intensity, the intensity with which history is rewritten, with which history is policed, um, the introduction of legislation, for example, around unacceptable variants. But even that you will still find actually in quite a lot of um, countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union or hmm. were in the, the, Warsaw, the Warsaw Pact. The big difference with Russia is the extent to which they aim to repeat that history, to bring it back to life, to make it something that is part of the everyday. And there are various ways for doing that. So one of them would be the intensive use of analogies like historical framing, you know, the idea that the fight in uh, that their war against Ukraine since 2014 has been a reliving of uh, what they call the Great Patriotic War, so the Soviet fight against Nazism from 1941 to 1945. And then alongside that, the active effort to have children um, in particular act out the battles, you know, the use of summer camps to indoctrinate children with a certain view of history. And I think it's that element. It's that combination of the intensity of the rewriting and everybody rewrites the past. It's the intensity of it combined with them trying to make this not just exist on a discursive level, but also to be almost a practice, something that, that you act out. Can you maybe describe for the people who are not so familiar with this topic, what are some of the key historical narratives mm -hmm. that the Russian state is pushing? How does uh, Russia seize itself and its own historical role? And how would Kremlin would, would want Russians to see it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are some core positive events and then some core negative events. So if we think about it sort of being constructed, Russia's history being constructed against, you know, triumph and tragedy, um, to use Bernard Gieson's term. So the idea that you have the, the negative events and they would include, for example, the time of troubles um, after when the Poles and the Lithuanians invaded and um, because there was no clear succession me me mechanism uh, many hundred years ago. But also the October Revolution, the February Revolution as well of 1917, um, 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And there's a common theme here. And we're going to come, I'll come back to that in a second. Because if we look at the positive events, we see that those themes are also there. So the positive events tend to be, first and foremost, the Great Patriotic War, which is really at the heart of all of this. But also events such as, for example, the Soviet superpower status, the imperial expansion, um, you know, the battles of Alexander Nevsky. Um, and um, various other, any time when Russia is a strong state um, or can be painted as one. And that's the point, is the history in a way, 
that's not the most important bit. The history can often be quite a bricolage already. We see that there are some imperial moments, there are some Soviet moments. Some bits are included sometimes and then dropped, or over time they become more in, sort of introduced into the pantheon, as it were, such as with the Afghanistan, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, which has been gradually rewritten and is now, particularly after the US withdrawal, more painted as a, as a success, um, or certainly in more positive terms than, than it was in the 1990s, for sure. And the point of the bricolage is that it's not so much the history that matters. None of this is really about history at all. It's more about using these stories as a scaffolding to make free key arguments. And those arguments are Russia needs a strong state. Without it, it disintegrates, its enemies come and take advantage of it. Second, Russia is a great power, an inherently, innately great power that has a mission in the world, you know, a unique mission. And then thirdly, that Russia is has its own special path of development. It's a separate civilization. It should not follow a Western path. And provided that the history can be used to make one of these three points, it is therefore usable. I, I think I need to point out the second one that you mentioned, that Russia is a great power, because um, from personal experience of living in, in Russia for some time, I think that was the one that I've encountered quite a lot. And it was always sort of surprising to me how uh, many Russians um, see this fact that their country is a great power, it's very important and powerful in the world, or that's what they like to think, um, how important, how terribly important it is for them. And I've always wondered if it's some kind of a, um, perhaps a compensation for um, um, things that Russia lacks in other areas? Or uh, where does this perception of importance that we need to be strong, we need to mm -hmm. be powerful, we need to have a strong military, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. I often identify it with a need to have a strong state. And I think there are various reasons for this. But the one I come back to most often, because I agree there's a popular, this is a popular great powerness. It's not just something that's derived from the state. And the the issue that I keep on coming back to is Russia's lack, I suppose, of a normal or a typical European embrace of nationalism. And often what comes across in so many of these languages, not just from elite discourse, but also from, you know, the many hundreds, if not thousands of interviews I've been doing since 2014 on these on these topics with Russians, you know, around Russia is the identification of the Russian nation is often seen as embodied in the state rather than the people hmm. and so if we think about this current war uh, russia's current war on ukraine it's quite common for example in western media to see people saying oh well but what about these deaths what about the fact that it's making certain you know segments of the population making it harder for them economically but that's for many reasons that's not going to probably be an issue for Vladimir Putin not least because he doesn't care but also that's not where the greatness of the nation comes from the mm. greatness of the Russian nation is not measured through its ability to um, make life better for its people it's measured by its ability to project its power um, and mainly that means projecting it abroad is that uniquely Russian or do we <laughs> see it in I don't know other because i would say in china maybe that mentality is probably quite similar i mean i can't speak in too much detail about china right because i'm not a, a sinologist but certainly in the area of memory i mean russian and chinese uses of memory are incredibly similar and there's often you know actually collaboration between them in, in promoting certain narratives um again i've in general i'm skeptical i'm skeptical you know of the of the russian soul approach on from either side i don't think there really is anything i mean Every nation is unique and therefore is any nation unique. Mm -hmm. I don't think that what we're talking about um, is something specific to Russia, but I think they're all conditions that perhaps exacerbate certain tendencies. Um, any nation has certain cultural implants. If we think, I'll talk about Britain because obviously I'm British, so I feel more comfortable sort of criticizing my own. Um, if we think about Britain, there were certain elements of and attitudes within Britain. They've been there for a long time that never went anywhere, but that needed to maybe be teased out and were teased out, let's say, during the Brexit referendum, during the debates in the run up to this. And it's not that 
the debates created them. Those attitudes were already there, but they also weren't really that prominent. They weren't seen mm. as, as that important. So that's why I like the idea of, of cultural implants, because I think before earlier, we were talking about the fact that my first time in Russia was in 2008. And you would have found many of these same attitudes, really, but they would have been quite below the surface, they wouldn't have been very prominent in terms of priorities. So yes, there was a demand there for some of these narratives, but that also, the, the state, it not only reacted to that demand, it also then manufactured mm. more of it um, and of course manipulated it to its own end. So I think that it's a symbiotic process rather than... I wonder to what extent this push of certain historical narratives is something that came with Putin and his mm -hmm. regime and to what extent this has been there before and was used to used by, um, for example, the uh, Soviet uh, leadership back in the day? Yes, I mean, there's a long history um, of using history in Russia, perhaps markedly more than in other countries, actually, if we look through um, the use, in particular, the use of historical analogies. Um, when it comes to the Soviet period, for obvious reasons, history and the correct understanding of history played an important role just because of the nature of sort of Marxist doctrine or Marxist ideology, however you want to put it. And I think that lingers. I think that lingers in many countries, actually, even those countries that are very staunch in rejecting um, the legacy of that time, because you do have this idea that there is a correct version of the past and that once that version of the past is divined it must be defended because if not then that will lead countries lead the nation the people astray from the correct path and there's something quite marxist about that even when it's applied you know to bring down communist statues in a sort of odd teleological way so i think yes some of these narratives were already there of course there was incredible russification policies under uh, stalin in particular um, I mean, in general, a lot of imperial history was, um, I suppose, rehabilitated, um, you know, during the Soviet Union, after that sort of truly revolutionary period of, of the Bolsheviks, of the early Bolshevik years. I mean, it always makes me laugh. Well, I mean, maybe a bitter laugh, but that, um, you know, the famous Bolshevik historian, Krosky, who was, um, I suppose, sort of cast out because he depicted imperial Russia as imperial and undermined the um, el the extent to which it wasn't a traditional Western imperialism, but was more a friendship of nations that the Tsars promoted. I mean, that shows quite how, quite a lot of continuity with something that I think probably Nicholas I would have liked to have written. <laughs> so um, yes, you have that continuity of narrative, continuity around the idea of Russia as a strong state. Just coming back to the um, idea of, of Russia as a great power mm -hmm. and Russian greatness, I think there's an interesting paradox because it seems like on one hand, Russia likes to see itself as a great power, as maybe an empire. And on the other hand, it seems like Russia likes to see itself as a victim or it at least it often presents itself as a victim of the West, NATO, NATO expansion. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. I think, though, that actually that tension, that tension between those two points that you make, Russia is innately great, and yet Russia is being victimized and humiliated by external powers. That tension is what works so well. That's where the political power is to be found, almost mm. the political force and energy, because in Putin's terms, it would be Russia was on its knees, i.e. the West put Russia on its knees, and now it's getting up it, off its knees again. Now Russia is kind of standing proud again. So that's actually where the power is because that's where the injustice is also to be mm. found. The notion that, you know, Russia has this right. And again, often World War II, the great victory of 1945 is referred to here. You know, Russians spilt their blood, you know, sacrifice. Of course, the Soviet victory is then nationalized towards Russia. And no mention is made of, you know, various other aspects that might complicate this narrative. But, you know, we spilt our blood. We have a right to be a great power, to be at least a regional great power and, you know, to dictate to a certain sphere of influence or at least to have some kind of decisive vote over certain aspects. And this is, again, Putin's ultimatum of 2021. So basically, we are a great power, but others are trying to push us down. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like in the national security strategy, that sense that the West has been trying to destroy Russia 
um, just like it destroyed the Soviet Union. Uh, it's been using a lot of different methods for that, including trying to erase Russia's historical memory because that's an attack directly on, this is not my words, <laughs> an attack directly on the, the Russian people, the Russian nation. But actually it's the West who's going down, you know, and Russia is back and there's a new multipolar world order. And in that order, you know, Russia is going to be back in its rightful position. So Russia has been betrayed. Russia is... Um, by its very nature and essence, so kind and self-sacrificing that it was taken advantage of. But now they've had to um, toughen up a little bit and they're no longer going to let themselves be taken advantage of. That would be the, the framing of it. It might sound a little uh, theoretical, what we're talking about, but it does have very real consequences. And one of those um, consequences is... Uh, basically Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which does have a lot of historical aspects of it. And there's a big layer of working with the historical memory around that. Um, Putin famously published an essay a couple of months before the invasion in which he basically claimed that Ukraine as a state shouldn't exist. And that has been used as sort of an historical excuse for or a pretext uh, for the invasion. And going back to that, going to that, I wonder if you could explain what role does Ukraine play mm -hmm. in the Russian uh, perception of history? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's such an important question. And I always love it when people ask me it because I'm like, okay, this is a question I think that that everybody should be asking because once you start to answer it you start to it also starts to make certain policy options in terms of the war and its resolution a bit clearer too ukraine is central to russian history but let's put it more bluntly just before the critical infrastructure attacks began on on civilian infrastructure last year in, in kiev and around ukraine sergey lavrov said um ukraine has no history without russia it's a pretty standard comment. It's in the essay that you spoke about, which Putin was very involved actually in editing. Of course, it was ghostwritten, most say by Vladimir Medinsky, former culture minister and general kind of historical obsessive. But Putin was very involved with the writing of this essay. It did reflect his own views. It wasn't just something some person made up. But Lavrov's, yeah, Lavrov's comments, not all that shocking. But when you think about it, I would say it's the opposite. I would say it's Russia in its current guise, the current Russia they try to say as Russia that, that they try to say exists. That doesn't work. It doesn't exist without Ukraine. Because how can Russia be a great power on any level when it can't take Kharkiv 30 miles, well, 30 kilometers from its border? How can it be this civilizational alternative if with this mission to bring, you know, historical truth and, and self-awareness of one's culture when it can't even attract ethnic Russians, sometimes genuine Russian citizens who just happened to move to Kharkiv or Ukraine when they were young to be part of its Russian world. How, if Ukraine's not part, if Ukraine refuses to be part of the Russian world, if Ukraine is a separate individual country, then which it proves again and again that it is, then how can Russia be the heir to Kiev and Maurice, even the very beginning, even the very origins? And it doesn't matter that much, the, these arguments, because Russia could just choose to be a different type of Russia, but it won't. And I think in some ways, it's this, this entire national image, this entire narrative or script of why Russia is a nation, what makes Russia, is a, nation, Russia a nation that has been developed in earnest since 2012, until we reach a point where that is torn up and rewritten. And many countries have rewritten their national script. It's not, it would be difficult for Russia, but it's not, you know, completely unconceivable. But until that point happens, Russia will continue to be a threat at the very least to Ukraine, if if not, um, if not to many other um, places and peoples. Because Ukraine is not going to, you, I mean, Ukraine really has never, deep down in terms of, I suppose, the the nationally conscious core of, of Ukrainian society has never accepted that narrative. And even if you think back to the Yanukovych years in Ukraine, when you had people voting for party of regions or even later for opposition bloc, it's often described as those people who are pro-Russian. Well, I mean, they wanted to have good relations with Russia, 
Mm. They wanted to trade with them. They often, you know, liked being able to use Russian language in official situations or in schooling. But outside of the Donbass, and in the Donbass it was um, well under 20%, there was absolutely no um, appetite for, you know, to be to become part of Russia. And again, even in Donbass, I stress, it's still, you know, under 20%. Um, it's not like it was a majority sentiment. Everywhere else it was infinitesimal. So um, Ukraine... Russia invaded a country that it thought existed, but that didn't. And I think you could make a pretty strong argument, never really had. I guess if I'm going to dig uh, even deeper than that, um, you've meant, you've said that uh, how could Russia be a great power if it um, uh, can't even uh, conquer um, Kharkiv, which is um, just a couple dozen miles um, from its borders. And... To me, someone who's, uh, I guess, not Russian or Ukrainian, it doesn't sound like it, that should make a major difference. In oh, no, it shouldn't. It's not. It's. I don't think that that's what makes a country a great power, to clarify. But I'm saying in Russia's terms, right. it cannot answer the demands it's making of itself. itself. It can't meet those. Because in Russian terms, if Russia is this great power, mm. you know, that's this military, this huge kind of you know, second army in the world, etc. But it can't take Kharkiv. It's showing up its narrative mm. to be false. Mm. Um, its its story isn't holding. Um, the evidence isn't there. And that's one of the reasons why I imagine we will see, you know, it's we've moved into this war of attrition now. And I imagine that we'll, you know, this will work quite well, bluntly, for the Kremlin, because the war is pretty sustainable for Russia. But the peace really isn't because they've told this story, you know, through an incredibly intensive amount of propaganda, you know, since 2014, Mm. um, arguably, you know, since 2004. And what happens if they just take, you know, they just take over a certain amount of territories? They're going to have to justify why this story wasn't true. Mm. So there's absolutely no benefit for them in um, because right now, as, as it stands, and I think again the symbolism of Kharkiv as a Russian-speaking city, as a country, as a city, sorry, so close to the border, is particularly important. But right now, as it stands, and I think as Har- provided that Kharkiv stands, the story doesn't make sense. I guess to fully understand it, if I guess there are two ways to look at it, and it's a bit of a chicken and an egg mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, question. I wonder if from the russian leadership Mm -hmm. the decision to made to invade ukraine was basically a pragmatic um geopolitical uh decision that was that used the history as a pretext Mm -hmm. for it or if they actually see this historical narrative as true and and so important that it required uh, the 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 invasion and the the the, the military Understood. intervention i don't think it's either or i think that from the kremlin thinking it was a practical a pragmatic geopolitical decision they wanted to control ukraine um it was important to them they feel like the west is becoming considerably weaker that now was a decent time that they could strike that probably the west wouldn't support ukraine that much and and bluntly you know we can all pat ourselves on the back but if zelensky had fled be interesting to know how much the west would have supported Hmm. ukraine so i think it was a pragmatic geopolitical decision and everybody very quickly said oh it was a complete disaster now clearly the first phase of the war taking kiev in three days was a total disaster but whether or not it will end up over the long run being a total disaster for the kremlin really depends on what happens now and Hmm. on the west's resilience um which which is a bit in question so Yes, I think it was a pragmatic geopolitical decision, but I think that pragmatic geopolitical decision was in, deeply informed by this view of history, by this view of what it means to be a nation, what Russia is, and by the the types of insecurities um, and difficulty of explaining a coherent narrative for why Russia is a nation, and um, in particular in the post-Soviet context, and trying to find... I suppose, a type of mission, a type of, of raison d'etre or mm. purpose. And often, I mean, as I argue in Memory Makers, to me, 
from the study of the mainstream discourse, but also of the doctrines of the political, of you know, the interviews of the senior politicians, that mission becomes this idea of cultural consciousness, that Russia has this unique access to historical truth, that Russia is almost uniquely in touch with its own roots, its own like authentic self, I suppose, in Instagram language. And therefore it's its job is to help other countries resist Western cultural colonization and also return, um, you know, and get back in touch with with its real self. And that makes sense also for Ukraine. We see it push these messages a lot around um, certain countries in the, the so-called global south. I think there often that's not the main driver of the relationship. And I think there's definitely an instrumentalization of this language. It's not always, mm. you know, truly held and truly believed. But I think in Ukraine's case, there is a genuine sense that Ukraine has betrayed Russia. Ukraine has been brainwashed into not knowing its own history. And Russia is going to to bring that that history or that memory back. And it comes up a lot in the occupied territories. I've just finished a report on propaganda in the occupied territories. And the notion that Ukraine wiped people's memories during the, you know, well, hmm. when these territories were not in the Soviet Union in that sort of, well, what they present as the intervening period, because they present it as a historical, abnorm- like sort of anomaly that, that Ukraine was in charge. Um, that Ukraine focused on wiping these people's true memories and now Russia was here and it was back and it's bringing all of its kind of memorial infrastructure, you know, the Russia, my history, historical propaganda parks, the um, patriotic military history education camps um, for for children, the schooling system, which again is very focused on this. So um, there's a whole infrastructure around it that Russia has has already um, established um, in the temporarily occupied territories and I mean those since since 2014, uh, those since 2022, those since 2014 actually often have even more of a historical obsession, um, in particular Donetsk, or Donetsk, so-called Donetsk People's hmm. Republic, than, than in Russia itself. And I guess, um, to what extent is Ukraine unique in this uh, thinking? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I would say that you could make from the Russian perspective, if Russia can be a great power without Ukraine, then perhaps it can be a great power without the Baltics or Georgia or Finland uh, and all these places that at one point were part of Russia or under Russian control. I think you're right. I think that Ukraine is central to this and that's why there's a limit um, to analogies that can be drawn with what has happened. You know, even, you know, Russian aggression in Chechnya or Russian aggression against Georgia, for example, because Ukraine occupies an entirely different space. It's part of core fundamental myths for Russia's understanding of itself. You know, the notion of Russia as the big brother in the Tryon nation of, of Eastern Slavic countries, Russia, Belarus, um, and, and Ukraine. And also, of course, it's Russia's origin story. Um, which links into its view of itself as a European state, as a Christian state. Um, Could you maybe explain that a little mm-hmm. bit, the origin story? Mm-hmm. So um, I'll start, I'll explain it first through some statues, I think. So outside the Kremlin, there's a statue to Prince Vladimir the Great, and it was opened in 2016, I believe. Um, and there's a similar, there's a statue to the same man where he's called Volodymyr, uh, Prince Volodymyr, um, in Kiev, and the statue in Russia is four centimeters taller than the, than the statue in Kiev, which was built, you know, a hundred odd years ago. And the reason why you, the reason why there's a statue to him is because he was the 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 grand prince who baptized Rus into Christianity. Um, so, for Russia, and in particular for the Church, which of course played an incredibly important role, as in many countries. Um, in writing the original sort of national stories, national accounts of, of the Russian nation and its 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 you know special relationship with God, et cetera, et cetera. It all sort of comes back to the primacy of Prince Vladimir and of being able to trace one's heritage back to him. So for example, Ivan the Third, um, when he took the lands, the sort of proto-democratic statelets um, of, of, of Novgorod and Pskov, he argued that he had the right to do that, um, even though he was just the prince of Muscovy, you know, at that time, you know, pretty kind of standard, although albeit growing, um, princedom under, still under Mongol, well, 
struggling with Mongol occupation, probably the best way to put it. He argued that he had the right to expand, the right to take over people's land, to, to take these lands because he could link his heritage back to Prince Vladimir. And so Prince Vladimir is the element that legitimizes it all. And in the Kiev, in the in the Ukrainian view, he has not really anything to do with Russia. You know, Muscovy, Russia comes from Muscovy, which is, you know, a state that was just one of many princedoms um, under the Mongol occupation, has no link to, to Kiev and Rus really whatsoever, um, was not really established during Kiev and Rus. But from the Russian perspective, Russia, and in particular Moscow, is not only the inheritor of Kiev and Rus, it's also the inheritor alongside this of a really fundamental Christian mission, which also links into the fall of Byzantium and the notion of Moscow as the third Rome. So the first Rome fell, moved to Byzantium. The second Rome fell, and there will not be another. That's that's sort of the way the story goes. So it, it also ties in not just to Ukraine's importance in Russia's origin story, but Ukraine's importance in where this deep-seated belief in Russian greatness comes from how it's so wrapped up there, mm. even sometimes when it's not immediately visible, when you dig or just scratch a little bit at the surface, you see that ultimately these myths about Russia's mission, about Russia's special place, Russia's special religion, Russia's special this or that, is based ultimately on Ukraine. Um, or there's some important element. It doesn't make sense. If you took Ukraine out of the story, the story would fall apart. The narrative, the plot wouldn't work. Mm. I'd like to move to... Um your second book that mm -hmm. you've mentioned, uh, Russia's War, mm -hmm. because one of the main arguments that you make in the book is that basically this war in Ukraine uh, shouldn't be seen as only Putin's war or the Kremlin's war as it's sometimes presented, but that is a, that it's Russia's war because it hasn't been imposed on the Russian people, but that majority of the Russian people actually do support it. And... I guess if you could explain mm -hmm. why is that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in general, I probably say acquiesce in the sense that they'll go along with it. So um, quiet support. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, exactly. Like a quiet support. Um, I mean, the end of the day, what difference does it hugely make? I mean, at this point, sometimes with the discussions around, oh, you know, do Russians really support or do Russians not support the war? If you're doing the lighting for the propagandist who goes on and says that, um, Ukrainian children should be drowned or if you're you know the clerk who works in the office that helps to um, sort of that does the bureaucracy for the filtration camps for the kidnapped children really does it matter if that person deep down actually probably wouldn't have declared the full-scale war not really I mean from any in any kind of um, useful policy discussion and what's more we can never really know I mean, it's very difficult as an analyst. You can't really know what people truly believe. Sometimes I'm not entirely sure, you know, how deep my own beliefs on things are and I have to think about it. So that's what I would, I would say. First of all, there's a bit of a red herring sometimes in these discussions, though not in your question, because your question is focused on why. And that's what I think is the important question, rather than focusing on this sort of zombie debate of, oh, is it 69% who support mm. it? Or is it actually more like 58%? Much more useful is to think why, because there are Russians in the West that support the war. And there are people in the West who have nothing to do with Russia and have never even been there, who actually find ways to justify and sympathize with this war. So the idea that it's completely, you know, this bizarre opinion that nobody could come to is, 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 is equally bizarre in my view. Now, if we come back to Russia, I'd say one of the key elements to understand is it's often spoken about as, oh, the Kremlin's line this, or this is the line the Kremlin takes. And that's not quite true because the Kremlin takes many lines. There's actually quite a diverse pro-Kremlin media space occupying, you know, offering different stories to appeal to different types of people. So, you know, there's certain channels that appeal to those who are a bit kind of nostalgic for the, have a bit of imperial nostalgia. There's other newspapers, for example, Komsomolska Pravda, that caters to the red-brown audience or those, you know, who very much miss the Soviet Union are quite left-wing economically, but also quite nationalist um, and anti-immigrant in other ways. So there's quite a wide spectrum, provided that they essentially back up the core essence of what the Kremlin is doing and any important matters, that's fine. And the editors are clever people. They know they know how to stay on the right side. And, and of course, it's massively in their economic and, and other interests to do so. 
And so I suggest, based on this, you know, reality of what the Russian information space looks like, um, I suggest that it's best to understand it as a spectrum. So the Kremlin isn't trying to make everybody a true believer in the war. In fact, if anything, true believers are a bit problematic, as we saw with Prigozhin, because they start to then get ideas about how the war should be fought and, you know, why it isn't being fought properly and so on. It's much better to have the sort of people who are happy to go along with it. Um, you know, it resonates with them, they support it, but they're probably not going to get their own ideas about how it should how it's best to to prosecute the war. Hmm. That said, you do still need to have some of the active supporters if you want to mobilize men. And that's really been the role of the Z bloggers hmm. is, is to kind of keep that mobilization element up. But I argue that the Russian propaganda system tries to push people. So it tries to push people who are in active opposition just towards being apathetic. And there's a lot of narratives that you'll come across there. Um, you know, just, well, I can't do anything about it. Um, and it's worked. I mean, if you speak to, um, if you look at sort of the polling and focus groups that are still done, you know, people who are against the, who are willing to express themselves as against the war also have the highest um, or the lowest rather belief in their own agency, their own ability to affect any change. By contrast, people who support the war believe that they have very high agency and capacity to affect change. But of course, they're not necessarily interested in affecting any change because mm. they're quite happy with the situation as it's continuing. But yeah, so then that makes the apathetic people, you know, to try and push those who are apathetic into, oh, do you know what? It's my country. I'm Russian. I don't have another country. I'm just going to support my country since we're at war. Mm. Um, for those people, it will also, that group, it will then try to push those people into more of a sort of the ritual support category that we discussed. You know, those those people who support it, it resonates with them. They're really behind this, but they're not really going to get their own views. Mm. And then you have to be very cautious with the active supporters or you might end up <laughs> having to shoot them out of planes um, after after a sort of mutiny attempt. So it's more, I think the point I'm trying to get at is that it's much more complicated than it looks at first glance, both in terms of the propaganda and how cleverly they use the different pl propaganda platforms, but also, of course, in terms of that resonance, which we've already discussed, I suppose, a fair amount, because propaganda in any country to work, it needs a platform. Clearly, Putin has enough of a platform in Russia to get his views out, but it also needs a resonance. It needs to relate to, to what people, how people understand the world. I was, my next question was going to be, what is it that Russians actually think about the war? But mm -hmm. I guess your answer is that there's not, it's a wide variety of opinions, but I guess at the end of the day, majority still supports it, even maybe though for different reasons. I think so. I think that's a pretty like fair kind of general conclusion to come to. Um, I was thinking about this issue yesterday in a discussion with somebody in response to a recent sort of Yuri Dud, um, one of Yuri Dud's infamous like 17 hour interviews. But um, quite often when I speak to people, I speak to people, I wouldn't really describe them as pro-war. Um, I think often if it was up to them, they might even stop the war if that was, you know, entirely in their mm. power or certainly reduce the intensity of it. But they subscribe to all of the elements that made the war possible. Mm. And by the war here, I'm talking about the full scale invasion, because that's another aspect that's often overlooked. It's not just that the war has been going on since 2014. It's if we look through the opinion polling, which, of course, is more reliable as well at that point for, for different reasons and the focus groups. And of course, I myself lived there you know, throughout that period and was doing a, you know, a number of sort of interviews and sociological research. But 8% um, of Russians on average across between 2014 and 2021 thought that Russia had any blame in the annexation of Crimea. 8%. Mm. Most people thought that it was Ukrainian nationalists who were to blame. And then the second was, of course, the West. Um, the attitude towards Ukraine was one that was dismissive. Um, it did not take Ukraine seriously. There was no hatred. There was no real hatred. But even now among broad swathes of the population, I wouldn't say that you see hatred towards Ukraine. Of course, you do in some sections. But what you largely see is just an indifference. Nobody really cares. But they're suffering if they have to suffer, you know, for some kind of abstract notion of Russia. Hmm. Then that's some, that's a sacrifice that many Russians are able to live with. Do you think that this perception 
um, has changed since the beginning of the war in any way, or is it basically exactly the same? You know, it's interesting because it, that becomes harder for me to answer because, of course, once the war starts in earnest, then I can't, I have not been unable, I've been unable to go back to Russia and without being able to do kind of on the ground research, I, I just, I, I always tread with caution. It doesn't appear to have changed hugely with the exception of a kind of a period after the successful counteroffensives of 2022, um, when then you did start to see, you know, some kind of variation and 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 almost chaos um, mm. in some of the responses. But in general, I mean, this year, particularly after the fact that the counteroffensive has not gone according to plan, let's put it that way, um, Russians find the idea of Ukraine winning this war totally laughable. Mm. Um, they do not take Ukraine seriously. And of course, the media has explained it um, in a way where it's not that Ukraine has put up this great resistance. It's because the West has come in and you know has funneled all of these weapons and is deliberately using Ukraine as an anti-Russia project, as it always historically has done, as per Putin's 2021 essay. So they also have a kind of explanation that helps them to, to keep on to their current or their, their pre-existing worldview. Where I would say there's been a big shift is in soldiers. So I recently returned, and indeed next week I'm returning back to um, some de a number of deoccupied territories around the sort of Kharkiv, um, in Kharkiv region and, and just over into the border in, in Donetsk region. And what's so interesting there is to hear the stories, I mean, harrowing, but interesting to hear the stories of the residents because who lived under occupation, because very often there's a real anger that comes out of the soldiers when they arrive and they realize that not only are they being lied to that ukrainians definitely are not sitting there waiting to be liberated mm. you know that they're not these persecuted russian speakers that they just you know that there aren't these collaborators waiting to help them that everybody just basically at this point hates them and wants them to go away and moreover that ukrainians aren't living in kind of poverty and, and misery in fact many of them live a little bit better really than than Russians in similar circumstances and the anger that comes out of that is just is remarkable I mean in lots of different each village had its own story of occupation but they all had certain aspects that were the same and one of them was that when soldiers arrived they would deliberately target the nicest house hmm. just in some sort of rage and when you walk around places like Izum where there's still a lot of graffiti from the Russians and, you know, a lot of it centers around the theme of you thought you could live well. Well, ha, we're here now. Or, you know, mm. oh, it's going to be only it only gets better from here. Sort of sarcastic graffiti um, or, you know. And then there's, of course, the famous picture of of um, the house where the Russians had written um, who allowed you to live so well. So I think that that will play a role this the breaking down of the myth, the hmm. Russian myth, the Russian kind of view of, of Ukraine, I think that that will come into into focus more and more. But for now, it seems to be something much like the war in general, actually, that, that ordinary Russians are largely protected from. So you think that when these soldiers eventually go home or some of them, um, that might be an issue for the regime? Not for the regime, but I think it will shift attitudes. Mm. But it may just make people hate Ukrainians more. I mean, it could go in a lot of different directions. It seems there's a, one sort of a, a type of opinion that appears quite often that I thought was really interesting. And that's basically people who didn't agree with the war when it's and they wouldn't... Uh, want it to happen but now that it has happened they're just on board because um they feel like now that it's on russia has to win it and mm -hmm. i was wondering if you could maybe explain where is that coming from just to clarify i'm I, you're talking about people who um it's not just that they were kind of indifferent or outside of politics like they actively did not like the war when it began like op opposition not really more people who wouldn't agree who would prefer if the war didn't happen but now that the war has happened they think that mm -hmm. russia has to continue until oh, it yeah. wins that basically 
Oh, uh, I see. Defeat yeah. is unacceptable. I understand. I understand. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's the vast majority of Russians, including, I mean, one of the groups that I think is really interesting is the group of people who were very strongly opposed, some of whom even left the country, some of whom mm. even protest, who have since returned back to Russia and broadly now support again would be too strong but certainly have made their peace with the war in the sense that they want russia to win it because the only thing worse than starting a stupid war is is losing the war they don't want to have to pay reparations to ukrainians you know they don't want they realize that history is written by the winners so that if russia is defeated it would be bad you know for russians and there's often a bit of an uh, an anger um at the west for somehow not um you know, providing them with the same standard of life that perhaps they'd been enjoying in Moscow um, without really any introspection as to why people, why those resources may not, might have been directed towards another country that was, you know, undergoing bombing at that time. So I think that's a difficulty. I mean, another issue as well is, this is a bit of a broader one, but that comes to the questions about sort of responsibility and and I think feeds into why these people who were sort of against the war have been able to, some of the people, um, so we're not talking about large, large numbers here, mm. but some of the people who are against the war have been able to make peace with it is a general reluctance among many in Russia, but including among the opposition to really see themselves as part of a bigger society or community. It's incredibly individualistic, which is quite ironic given some of the propaganda. Mm. But it's an incredibly individualistic society. And in particular, you know, the liberal opposition are, are highly um, hyper-individualized. And so that then makes it difficult um, to create this, this sense of, you know, this is our country and they are doing this in our name and our names are going to be blackened and so we have to fight against this it's much more well i personally didn't do anything to start this war and i personally actually did this um which is another interesting con conceptualization which i think clashes with perhaps um not not with everybody in the west view but i think it certainly clashes with the view in ukraine let's leave it at that I wonder to what extent do you think that the public opinion is actually important for the Kremlin? Mm. Because I've heard uh, quite various views mm. from that. The It actually doesn't matter at all mm. because um, basically the government doesn't need the public approval mm. to do anything. Mm -hmm. To the other side that actually Kremlin is kind of obsessed with mm. uh, opinion polls and surveys and it collects a lot of data and it does influence its decisions mm -hmm. in quite a particular way. Mm -hmm. So where do you think the truth is? I mean, again, I think that both elements are true and they're not necessarily contradictory. I don't think that at this point, I mean, it would have been different 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but at this point, no, I don't think that the Kremlin does need public opinion such as it is to be on side. They can just carry on and do what they want. You know, mm. there's no real mechanisms for protest and the state is such that be very hard um, there's no political elites against him and, and revolutions and uprisings don't succeed without a combination of elites and and the populace so i think that those people are right however we do also know that putin is genuinely obsessed with polling that he has his own private pollsters you know that this is something that he cares about that he gets his media monitoring including a telegram now every day so probably it doesn't hugely matter to how the war will progress in the next, let's say, year, two years, three years. But Putin follows it closely. And I mean, Putin could have called a general mobilization at certain points. Right now, it's probably not so necessary, but at certain points, it really did feel quite necessary mm. this year. And yet he didn't. And it's pretty obvious why. It's because of the reaction to the partial call for mobilization last year. So it does have an impact. It has the impact that Putin lets it because he cares. He cares about being a popular leader. Mm. Um, it, it apparently matters to him. Um, so I think it's probably more nuanced than just, yes, public opinion will decide. Um, you know, if public opinion turns against Putin, that's it. That's, that's not really going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't really need public opinion in that way, but he cares about it. Um, so he will make concessions to it and if it then matters, at least to mm -hmm. some extent, I wonder what could change it. If mm, sanctions and almost two years of war uh, and the 
quite high casualty rate didn't actually seem to change the public support in Russia for the war or Putin's approval ratings. Mm -hmm. What do you think could change that? It's an important question. I think often it's looked at in the sense of, okay, well, we need to change. Often I'm asked sort of what can we do to change it with an eye to, because then if the whole public turns against the war, then mm -hmm. perhaps the war will end, which I think is in any case a little, I mean, that's not how you're asking the question, but just other people, less informed things. Um, firstly, I think that would be an, a naive approach anyway, but in any case, the issue is that really views change when the facts change. So the biggest shifts, again, in Russian public opinion were because of Ukraine's like remarkable and very, very fast and surprising counteroffensive, particularly in Kharkiv last year. That's when the views began to change around a number of things and become, you know, much more malleable. This year we've seen really support kind of, I suppose, consolidating. We've Yes, yeah, some people have gone from supporting to not supporting, but other people have gone from not supporting to supporting. Mm. And bluntly, you know, the elites don't care. They either are happy to ignore the war or they broadly support the war. Um, it's only really the poorest section of people who are actually suffering from mm. the war. And they are the only group that actually has a strong um, majority against the war, apart from the very, very young as well. Mm. Um, so <laughs> until... Ukraine has decisive victories again on the battlefield, those opinions won't change. So you can't change the opinions in order for Ukraine to have decisive victories. Mm. You have to have the decisive victory first and that will change the opinion, which is why ultimately I think that for anybody who would like to see a different Russia, a, a Russia that was able to live constructively with its, with its neighbors and to actually focus on making lives for the people who live in Russia better, um, Probably the only thing that would lead that would lead to that would lead to a happier sort of Russia would be Ukraine's victory in the war. Now, how to define that victory is a different conversation for a different time <laughs> and perhaps outside of our remit. But still, um, I don't think it's possible. I don't the view these views are hardened. They won't just shatter because somebody comes along with a much better argument. They'll need a real shift in, in reality. So the key to changing public opinion is a victory on the battlefield. And the economic aspect of it, when the sanctions really start to bite and the economic level uh, and, uh, of regular Russians or, or the majority of Russians starts to go down, do you think that that could have an influence or that Russians are just used to suffering? I don't think it's that Russians are used to suffering, but there's some key points that mean that, well, firstly, sanctions when imposed, they never really um, function to turn people against the regime. I mean, we saw this in like Serbia, for example, where Milosevic really was not very popular and mm. actually he became more popular once sanctions were imposed because um, people felt like they were being punished. Um, and it's, you know, it just, it puts people's backs up to put it mildly. The other issue is that whenever there are economic troubles in Russia, that's when people become more nostalgic for a Soviet style economy because people associate the current economy with a market economy, with a Western economy. So the idea that it would push people towards wanting a more pro-Western economy or more integration with the West, that doesn't make sense in terms of well, the evidence that we can see. Um, the other aspect would be, you know, Many of the so-called systemic liberals who a lot of Western diplomats spent many, many years telling us, oh, you know, don't worry, these are the ones who will stop all the geopolitical craziness, have actually ended up being the most important players um, domestically in terms of making this war work. People like Kudrin, people like Nabuilina, because their incredibly effective management of the economy means that bluntly the sanctions have hit less. There's also a number of other things um, like import replacement and, and bluntly sanctions do need to be enforced a bit better. Mm. Um, so there's lots of different aspects to why sanctions haven't been as effective, but the main focus of sanctions should be on weakening Russia's ability to wage war. It shouldn't be on changing people's minds because it, it won't do that. And if it does, it will do it in unpredictable ways. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank I think, you. I think we're done. It was a great, great talk.